Hi everyone, thank you for joining. My name is Gal, but I promise I will properly introduce myself in just a few moments. So welcome to the talk, Short Text in the Wild. In this talk, I will share with you my experience in dealing with the Short Text Challenge. We'll discuss what's even considered short, uh, why it was more unique than we originally expected, and how we tackled it. Now, before we begin, some logistics. So all talks are pre-recorded, but I'm here. I'm keeping an eye on the chat. So feel free to ask questions, I'll answer them there. Also, since this talk is pre-recorded, I don't know the exact slide you're on, so please make sure to use a complete question and not just, how did you do that? Lastly, when we near the end of the talk, I'll send out a link in the chat to a breakout room, which is basically a video chat room, and you will be able to join it to ask questions, make remarks, or you know, just keep the conversation going. Okay, so let's begin. Thank you for the great time last night. Uh, heart, sushi, martini. Nike Air Force 107. Having problem buying clown costume, please help. Merchant transaction, McDonald's 345552. Okay, so these are all short texts. Uh, we can try to think about what we understand from them as human beings, what information we derive from them, but without a doubt, at a first glance, they seem a bit random. So I work for PayPal, and these are some of the types of texts that we deal with on a regular basis. It can be item descriptions, messages sent over peer-to-peer -peer transactions, customer queries, etc. And honestly, extracting meaningful information from this mess is not an easy task, especially given the lack of research in the field. So when we first started working on this challenge, we obviously started by looking into what's already been done. We sat down and tried to find all the existing research around short texts. And I don't know what you think of when I say short texts, but I can tell you what happens when you try to Google it. You usually get researches on tweets. And we understand the reasoning, right? Basically, if we look at the scale of number of characters in a text, it may look like this where a book is the longest character-wise and tweets are the shortest. So we found researches on tweets. Great, no? So here's the issue. And the number of characters in a tweet is 280. while the number of characters in our text is more like 40. On the other hand, the number of papers published on the topic of NLP over Twitter, let's go with a lot. While the number of papers published on our type of text so we actually couldn't find any. So as I said before, I'm Gal Kochma. I've been a data scientist for four years now, almost two of which in PayPal. In PayPal, I'm a, mem I'm a member of a group called da uh, GDS, Global Data Science, a group of hundreds of data scientists, which is essentially the group that is in charge of the data science in PayPal. Inside GDS, I'm a part of a team that builds data science solutions across multiple business domains, and our customers are actually other data scientists. Now, why does this matter for this talk? <clears throat> because this means that in this project, we're looking to get text-based insights or features in an unsupervised manner so that they can then be used to solve a variety of business problems at PayPal, such as fraud detection, sales, category identification for marketing, etc. So here's what we'll be discussing today. We'll start with why text and particularly short text is important. Uh, we'll see what happens when we try applying out of the box solutions and spoiler alert, it's not great. Then we'll see what characteristics of the text led to this. And finally, we'll discuss what we should have done instead. So I want to say in advance that this is not going to be a super technical talk. We're going to discuss the main ideas and then review four practical tips for dealing with short texts. The goal of this talk is for everyone here to live with an understanding of how to deal with short and unusual types of texts. So let's start at the beginning. Why do we even care about texts? So in a nutshell, Text can give us a broader perspective and insights that we couldn't have gotten anywhere else. So let's say that we want to uh, use text to be able to detect fraud, which is PayPal's bread and butter. And let's say that we have a customer, we'll call him Bob, and Bob doesn't have kids and he lives in Israel. So if our system detects a purchase made by Bob at 4 a.m. Israel time, 
would probably think that's a bit unusual. But what if we also add to that that Bob bought children's toys? So this is information that could only have come from the text, it's not from the time of day, not from the sum of money that Bob paid, only from the product name. And when we add it to the previous information, this purchase becomes really suspicious. Or another example. So let's say that now Alice is buying a phone and she's paying $200 for it. Sounds okay, right? But what if our system detects that it's the new iPhone 12 that it knows should cost more? I mean, if anyone knows where I can get an iPhone 12 for $200, let me know, right? So again, this information could only have come from the text and it makes us look at the situation quite differently. Basically, text can show us the bigger picture and give us insights that we wouldn't have gotten otherwise. And while the examples that we just saw were specific to item descriptions, the bottom line here is true for text in general, long and short. So what do we mean by short text and what can it be used for, not just in PayPal, but in general? So let's think about the text that we encounter on a daily basis, on social media, when we're captioning our pics, on messaging apps, notes sent over money transfer apps, such as Venmo, instructions, or even when we write special remarks while ordering a meal online. So these are all usually short texts. They're very common, we all use them. Some of you might even be writing one right now while I'm talking. And even though uh, they oftentimes don't follow proper grammar rules, we all easily understand them. Now, this is not the case when we let a computer try and interpret them. It usually doesn't go very well. And as we saw before, not a lot has been done to deal with this challenge. Okay, so now that we hopefully know why we should care about this, um, and we already said uh, that we wanted to provide unsupervised NLP features on short text to be used by a variety of business problems, uh, business models. So we have an NLP problem to solve. And what do we do then? We obviously bring out the big guns. So as I said before, our customers are very talented data scientists and they wanted the best of the best. So we gave them Bert. We ran BERT and we used Spacey, which is another super popular NLP package also used by the GPT model for pre-processing and tokenization. And to make sure we're all on the same page, let's talk for just a quick minute about BERT uh, to understand what it does. And to do that, we'll start by talking about word embeddings through the simplest one that I know, which is word to vec so word vec helps us find a vector representation for each word in our corpus so that similar words will be close together in our vector space. And that's all by a simple method. Basically, tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are. So when uh, we look at a window around each word and use the adjacent words to find its vector representation. Okay, so we're not going to go into details about BERT since that's a whole other talk. But what you need to know is that BERT takes the main ideas behind word vec and builds upon them. The main things to note about it are these. So BERT is highly contextual, meaning that it notices the order of the words in both directions even. BERT provides dynamic embeddings, meaning that each word can be represented by different vectors according to the context. So that, for example, a river bank will have a different representation than the bank where we deposit money. The last thing is that BERT uses a tension mechanism, which gives extra weight to words that are found to be important, but are not necessarily near the target word in the sentence. Now, as you can imagine, it's much more powerful and much smarter than word of which is why it was quite a shock for us to see that word of gave us better results. So when we went to test both embeddings on a downstream task, classification task, we expected BERT sentence embeddings to be able to provide lift in comparison to word to vet but we actually found that the simple embeddings gotten from word to vet performed better. And I will make a small remark here and say that we tested both pre-trained models and models that were trained specifically on our text. <clears throat> so what happened? Why did word to vec outperform BERT? And was this really as surprising um, as we thought or were expectations just off? So let's see what happened. In an NLP problem, there are three basic steps. 
pre-processing, which is basically cleaning, tokenization, which is the separation into words or units for tokens, and finally embedding. So as I mentioned before, at first we used Spacey uh, for pre-processing and tokenization and BERT for embedding, since they are considered the best. So we'll now demonstrate using three examples, uh, the problems that we encountered while using Spacey and BERT out of the box. We'll see a problem that may arise with tokenization with embeddings of short texts by BERT. And we'll ask ourselves a question about context in general. So first let's look at Spacey. It has a great out of the box tokenizer, but let's look at this short text, for example. Big Mac, combo meal, no pickles, order ID 25563. Now, what do you think would happen here if you used Spacey to tokenize this? So what would happen is that 25563 would be considered a token. And do we want that? I mean, it's just an identifier, a random number with no meaning to represent this order. Also, ID would get separated into I and D since Spacey would assume that we meant I would. We might also lose the understanding that Big Mac and Combo Meal are specific terms that occur together and consider Big Mac, Combo, and Meal as four separate words. Now, while all of this might be true for a standard text, uh, it's not right for ours. And essentially this made us miss the entire meaning. Okay, so the second issue. Uh, let's also try to understand why simple word to vet outperform BERT. So we know that BERT uses transformers uh, and that they pay attention to the order of the words in both directions even. So what happens when we have a product description in which the order doesn't matter? Here's an example. Nike, Air Force One, white, size 40. Now, if we were to jumble up the words, we would get white, Nike, size 40, Air Force One. We all easily understand that this refers to, to the exact same product. The problem is that Bert might not agree. So lastly, our uh, third issue, or actually question, these messages are very short, as we said before. Sometimes they even just contain one word like pizza. But we said that we wanted to see who your friends are so we can say who you are. So we need a window around each word to be able to calculate its embedding, even when using simple word to vet. So how do we train an embedding on top of that, on top of one word? And we'll find out soon enough. Okay. So we just saw three examples demonstrating the unusual nature of the text and why out of the box solutions would not work well. If we had to try and sum up what's special about our text that requires this special treatment, we would have this. So there is use of a lot of unusual to tokens, emojis, numbers, abbreviations. There's no context. There is less meaning to the order of the words. The text can be very informal, again, contains slang or emojis, and the text can sometimes be automatically generated. Okay, so quick disclaimer. Obviously, BERT as is will work great on the types of text that it was trained for, such as Wikipedia. But the bottom line here is that just because something is good, it doesn't mean that it's good for everything. Okay, so that was a bit depressing. Uh, we just listed all the things that failed, basically. After trying all the above and more, we understood that we needed a new solution. We understood that we needed pre-processing and tokenization that are customized to our text, and that simple word embeddings will work better than BERT for short text. So what can we actually do? So as we said, there are three main building blocks to solving an NLP problem pre-processing, tokenization, and embedding. We'll now see four tips to do pre-processing and tokenization in a way that is customized to our text, after which we can use any word embedding method we'd like, though as we saw before, which one works best will also depend on our data. Okay, so first tip, uh, cleaning. We paid a lot of attention to how we clean the text. And what do I mean by that? So let's go back to the Big Mac example. And let's forget about Spacey and start with a clean slate. 
So we have Big Mac, combo meal, no pickles, order ID 25563. What can we do here? So first we can identify recurring term combinations such as Big Mac and combo meal. Second, we can add relevant terms to our dictionary so that this time ID would not get split into I and would. Lastly, we can encode numbers according to their context so that they all appear as the same token instead of a different one for each number. And just a call and small comment on how to do these things. So this is where the, we leverage the huge data that PayPal has. We can do something similar to bit pair encoding and basically keep as a token each term combination that occurs more than some threshold of times. Adding relevant terms to the dictionary can be done simply by knowing our text. And number encoding is actually not an easy task, uh, but here we can use the expected structure that we know it should have. So here's another example that we saw before. Thank you for the great time last night, uh, Martini Sushi Heart. So here, thank you is also a combination of words that we might want to consider together, though this may depend on our use case. Second, we need to encode emojis so that our model knows how to treat them. So here we need to decide whether we want their token to reflect the fact that it's an emoji and not the actual word or not. We, for example, kept the indication that it was an emoji with the expectation that the good embedding model will learn which real words they are closest to. And it did. So lastly, the product name that we saw before. Here we don't actually care about each individual word, but actually more about what they represent. So we care that Nike is a brand, that Air Force One is a shoe model, that white is an adjective and is probably irrelevant, and so is the size. And how do we do this? So this is again, not an easy task and the details are material for a whole other talk. So this was cleaning. Everything here we implemented on our own so that uh, we can then just apply a space tokenizer um, on top of it. Okay, so tip number two, context. Let's go back to the question from before. How do we train a word to vec model when we have just one word and basically have no context? So some of you may know this old saying, content is king. But if content is king, then context is the kingdom. And what do you do when you have no kingdom? You build it. So if I have a window of five in my word to vec training, but only one word in the message, Turns out that if we concatenate several messages from the same user and basically make up context, we get a better result than when we have no context at all. So this is actually an example we got off the internet. Notice here, for example, the word power. Without the context of Verizon or October rent, it might have been hard to understand that this refers to the payment of a utility. But once we have this context, everything becomes clearer. Okay, also note that we had, if we had just gone through the normal pipeline of training word to vec or, or BERT on these messages separately, we would have never found this out. Our third tip is to take care of important words. So after concatenating the messages, uh, we trained a word to vec model and averaged out the embedding vectors for each message while paying special attention to important words. What does this mean? So let's imagine that we work for an online retailer and we are tasked with finding the category for different items by their names. Here's an example, blue car 1978 Mustang. Which word should we pay more attention to here? Blue car 1978 or Mustang and why? So we should probably care more about the nouns and proper nouns than adjectives or verbs. And how do we do this? So this is something we can actually get uh, from an out of the box model such as spaces part of speech. And then we can give specific parts of speech more weight when calculating our message embedding or even only use them and ignore the rest. Lastly, the fourth tip with, which is not a part uh, of the building blocks that we discussed before but is a good extra step that probably should not be ignored, counters. 
So we didn't shy away from using simple features such as counters for different parts of speech, name identity recognition, number of characters uh, and words, or TFIDF for specific keywords. So when you wake up tomorrow morning and you want to do some NLP, keep in mind these steps, cleaning, context, care, and counters, or as we call them, the four C's. Now you can use any word embedding technique that you'd like, keeping in mind that contextualized techniques such as sentence work don't work well for her text. In summation, the main thing I want you to take away from this talk is that NLP is not one size fits all. We saw today the text in the wild are dirty. They contain emojis, bad grammar, abbreviations. We saw that out of the box tokenizer are just not good enough and that we can just apply BERT to short texts. Finally, we, we saw that we should apply the four C's according to the nature of the text, cleaning, context, care, and counters. Again, this is not applicable to all types of text. Popular algorithms and tools will work great on the types of text that they were trained for, such as BERT for Wikipedia. But if we make sure to understand the nature of our text before applying generic solutions, and keep in mind the four C's that we just saw, then we are guaranteed to have much better results. Thank you for listening. Um, I'll post uh, the link to the, to the video chat room uh, on the chat and feel free to join me there uh, for uh, keeping the discussion going.